Hi guys, it's time to talk about the 20th century. Um, so, so much happens in this century and because it's so recent and so well documented, our normally blindingly fast superficial conversation is going to be even more ridiculously blindingly fast. But here at least is a few bullet points, a few names, a few movements from this you know, enormously active century. Um, so probably, I guess, the first thing to note is, you know, now that we're up here in the second decade of the 21st century, these 20th century events of World War I and World War II sort of at last, um, you know, kind of begin to fade in prominence. Yes, Hollywood still makes the occasional World War II film. Authors still write the occasional World War II book. But those wars are not really so defining for us in the second decade of the 20th century, 21st century. Um, War certainly still is, right? I mean, we're, you know, we're constantly engaged in war, and it defines so much of our life and our culture, but um, not those two wars so much. But for the 20th century, you know, I think 80% of that incredible century really is, is so prominently shaped by these two great, you know, horrific wars. So before I dive in, let me make one quick sort of usage note. We've been using correctly these four big anchor words, ancient, middle, renaissance, modern. And that's a, a, a you know, if you're going to use four words to describe all of art history, all of human history, those are four pretty well chosen words. However, while we would call all of this the modern period, um, the term modern art is more specific and, you know, opinions on the dates will vary, but something like 1863 to 1972. So 110 years or so is what we would call modern art. And so for, you know, several decades now, we've been in um, what I guess was called postmodernism. And today, I don't know if we have a single word to talk about what, what we're doing today. Some people say things like post, post, neo, neo. But um, so... Um, Modern does indeed cover this whole time period, but when you say modern art, you're talking about a little bit narrower time period. So let's look at some modern art. Um, okay, so before World War I, we start the century, you know, leading up to that, um, that event uh, with this kind of modernist revolution and abstraction um, and a lot of isms. Uh, so suprematism, futurism, expressionism, cubism, fauvism. So the Fauves, uh, you know, as, as is often the case, I, I only scratch the surface in this, uh, in this chart. Um, uh, but, you know, certainly a, a leading Fauvist painter would be Henry Matisse and, you know, one of the uh, inventors of Cubism, Pablo Picasso. So Matisse, the master of color, and Picasso, the master of geometry. Uh, you know, entire courses are taught on, on these guys. So, you know, we really can't say much in 10 seconds. But anyway, um, you know, hugely influential for really the rest of that century. Um, uh, expressionism is, is a whole lot more than Kandinsky, but he is one really interesting artist. And we'll try to do a separate talk about abstraction. And we can say a little bit about Kandinsky and Monet and, and such things. Um, and now it's World War I and, and you know, art's put on hold while, while we go through this just incredible horror. And, and now we've got a couple of decades in between these world wars. And, you know, probably one of the first really dominant movements in this, you know, between the wars period is Dada. So Dada is kind of an anarchistic, chaotic movement. And their argument is that this horrific nightmare of World War I that we just escaped from, um, that if civilization and rationality and government and nations got us into that, then you know everything we know is wrong and turn it upside down, it can't possibly be worse. So, um, uh, so Dada rejected reason, logic, futurism, which they believed uh, had led to war. And instead, they engaged in nonsense, political anarchy, emotion, intuition, irrationality, negativity, pessimism. Um, they're really sort of headquartered uh, at the Cabaret Voltaire in Zurich, uh, Hugo Ball. And, um, you know, they said that they wanted to remind the world that there are independent men uh, beyond war and nationalism 
who live for other ideals. So it's a really powerful idea. Um, I can't help but note the word men, and I'm going to resist with great reluctance. I'm going to resist the temptation to go off on gender, and maybe we'll you know think about that somewhere else. But um, you know, you, you can't really critique historical writing because you know the male you know nouns and pronouns were used, but um, y- you know we're we're looking at a culture dominated by war and. Um, you know, when you look at human history, when you look at art history, I mean, gender is just so monumental and there's so much to be said. Um, I guess I'm starting to do what I wasn't going to do. But, you know, there's there's a great American civil rights moment when um, the Supreme Court says separate but equal is not equal. Yet even today in the 21st century, you know, women don't make a dollar uh, compared to a man and and and. Um, there's a lot of things to say okay i'm gonna just keep going (laughs) surrealism um uh okay so here's two rather prominent surrealists that you're probably familiar with salvador dali um i i guess one of the things that's really interesting about dali's distortions and there's a whole idea of altered states which we probably won't have time to talk about separately so let me just say a quick word about that now is You know, Dali and and other surrealists and other artists have painted these weird, distorted things that are not what our rational waking life is about. And you would think that the weird, I mean, there's plenty of art that the the general public rejects and has trouble with. And yet surrealism is an incredibly popular movement. When you walk into college dorm rooms, you often find Salvador Dali posters, you know, stapled to the wall next to the, you know, the sports star and the rock star and the cheerleader or whatever. Um, you know, could it be that these crazy distorted images, which do not exist in our rational, in our verbal world, that they are accessing some maybe non-verbal part of our consciousness. And so these, so to speak, wrong images in a way look right to us. Um, and Magritte, so, so often the, you know, these important Western artworks are found in museums on the East coast of North America or in Western Europe. But, you know, Magritte has an enormous body of work, but this, this painting from 1929, The Treachery of Images, you know, lucky us, it's right here at the L.A. County Museum of Art. And, you know, this translates to this is not a pipe. So it's a painting of a pipe that says this is not a pipe. So it's a pun. It's a joke. Ha ha ha. But as you start to dive in the the levels of ideas about representation and uh, reality, really, this is this is one of those simple things that you can unpack for a long time. So it's a it's a silly, simple painting that seems to just be endless in the questions it asks um, and ideas it offers. An organic sculpture, um, Calder, Moore, etc. And we think a little bit about utopia during this time period. Um, and I have actually a link for, if you click this link, it's to a video. So there's a 2010, obviously later, um, than this moment, uh, documentary film experience, I guess I'll call it. It's a live film performance that Sam Green and Dave Cerf, uh, did called Utopia and Form Movements, which is interesting. Um, it's a, it's a beautiful piece of work. It's incredible. Um, and it's interesting because they reflect on utopia. They think that, you know, we're so sort of wise and, if you will, jaded now that, that we don't think about utopia anymore. And, and they kind of lament that loss of, of even the hope for utopia. Um, but also, if you're interested in film or media or those kinds of ideas, they created something really unique in the way they present these ideas. So um, it's a feature length piece or it's an evening length performance but this link will take you just to a sort of like the first 10 minutes give you a taste of what they did so i really encourage you to watch this video okay and then plunge back into war again world war ii um and then world war ii is is over um and obviously the fact that we've been making films and and writing novels about it ever since you know suggests that it's, it, world war ii is, is perhaps never over but at least formally it's over Um, you know, a lot of Americans died in World War II, uh, but except for Pearl Harbor, the United States was not bombed in World War II. So that sets us apart from an awful lot of other countries. Um, The United States really fares well in the aftermath of World War II. Uh, Politically, socially, economically, 
uh, the United States enjoys a power in that second half of the 20th century that we have never known before or since. Um, and, you know, in terms of art, the United States has had many interesting artists before this time period, but on the global stage, the United States never that important. And now American art really comes to center stage. Uh, it comes to center stage with artists like Jackson Pollock. And so abstract expressionism, um, I guess I'll try to say a little bit more about the ideas of abstraction and, and how that plays in this abstraction and representation talk separately. Um, but we'll just say for now that um, this, is, this is the first time that you know, American artists really are the most important artists in the world and that a, a, an art movement that's begun in America becomes a style that the world is so, uh, so much paying attention to. And so now um, is the time that the, the capital of the art world moves from Paris to New York City or really the capital of the world moves from Paris to New York City. And, you know, now that we're in the second decade of the 21st century, people ask, you know, is the, is, is the capital of the world moving um, from New York City to Shanghai, perhaps, you know, we'll see how that goes. Um, and now just a whole explosion of post-war ideas. Um, Robert Rauschenberg with these combine paintings and objects, wonder cabinets, people like Joseph Cornell making things, happenings, Alan Capro influenced by John Cage, um, doing these, you know, crazy events. For me personally, Alan Capro is even more interesting. The work he does after the happenings is powerfully sublime and profound. But in terms of sort of getting this sort of zeitgeist of a generation, Alan Capro doing these crazy performance events in New York City and elsewhere um, is, is, is really, you know, just captivating. So 1959, 1966, incredible pieces. Um, Fluxus, a group that kind of harkens back to a Dada sensibility. And then after all of this sincerity of like abstract expressionism, we move into pop art, which is a very different, you know, playful or cynical kind of thing. So here's a couple of very iconic Warhol pieces, or here's his, you know, Mylar balloons. New realism. So much to say about somebody like Eve Klein. Um, he... Uh, he was really obsessed with the color blue. In fact, he patented his own formula of a, of a color that he called International Klein Blue. He had a sort of holy trinity of colors, pink, gold, and blue, and a lot of ideas revolving around that. Um, there's an amazing story with this picture. Maybe I can share it with you sometime. Um, and he did this living brushes thing, which I almost hesitate to show you because it's a little bit, you know, sort of silly and spectacular. And there's so much more to say about Klein and performance art. But this is a piece where he um, painted women blue and pressed them on canvas and so made these body paintings. And in this particular case, um, he also did, created pieces like this in his studio. But in this particular case, it's actually in a gallery. It's a performance. You can see there's a live orchestra over here. And so, you know, there's an interesting question um, and actually at the Museum of Contemporary Art here in Los Angeles a few years back, there was a show called Out of Actions. And so, you know, we can look before this to see paintings, 2D objects that were made as objects. And moving forward, we're going to talk about performance art and land and earth art and all these other movements um, that are not so much about objects, but maybe about, you know, ephemeral experiences that are, are had in a moment. And, you know, this maybe is an out of actions moment where... Um, we're creating 2D objects, but it is also engaged in a performative experience. Okay, a lot more to say about Eve Klein. And so we had abstract expressionism here, and now we have, again, abstraction, but we're gonna talk about geometric. Really a lot more artists, this is, uh, so I, my, my crazy chart really needs a lot more names on it, and way more people than Ellsworth Kelly, but he's a pretty interesting artist. Um, so he's pretty reductive. He's pretty minimal. Here's a, this is a symphony hall in Texas, and this is the lobby of this symphony hall. And you can see from the person the scale of this thing. Um, Kelly does a lot of monochrome, single panels. So he's one of those quote unquote modern artists that you know the general public often has difficulty with because they don't see you know the the heroic virtuosity of a Michelangelo who can do the human figure with such amazing talent and grace and all that. Um, but this is a whole different kind of experience. 
And if you think about it, you know, I said with Eve Klein that, you know, is, it, is he making objects or is he making experiences? And Kelly also kind of asked us different questions. We think about a painting, a 2D thing, as a, as a complete unit. But here, these paintings don't exist individually. They, ex they exist in resonance with the architectural space in which they exist. So in art, we talk a lot about figure and ground. It's an enormous topic that there's so much to say about. Uh, you know, to put it very simplistically, if you make a painting of me in front of, you know, a wall with some wallpaper pattern or a bookcase or whatever, that wallpaper, that bookcase, whatever it is, that's the ground and the figure is me. And again, loosely speaking, we care about the figure, you know, me or you or whatever it might be, and not so much about the ground. Um, and a painting normally contains both. It's a window and you go into it. But here, Kelly's painting, um, the, the whole painting really is figure and it is the architectural space that becomes ground. So this is deceptively simple, but there's really a lot more going on and the way that it relates to a site and a space. And let me say as quickly as I can that Marshall McLuhan, the culture theorist, also talks about figure and ground and takes it in a very different way. For example, he might talk about the automobile and he would say that we are obsessed with the figure, but it's really the ground that's important. That if you think about it, it's this massive repaving of a nation with this incredible interstate highway system. It's this incredible dependence on oil that you know, is engaged in so many global conflicts that that's the ground that we should be paying attention to, but we focus on the figure of, does my car have you know, sexy mag wheels? Does it have a dock for my iPod? And so we obsess on the figure of the car instead of the ground of all of these enormous issues. Um, so figure and ground many different ways. Anyway, okay, geometric abstraction and earthworks. Lots of people doing really powerful earthworks. One of the very best known would be Robert Smithson's Spiral Jetty. Um, so much to say about this piece, about his body of work, about other earthworks. Uh, minimalist art like Donald Judd, um, conceptual art, film and design, John Whitney, Charles and Ray Eames, really interesting people, but I better keep moving, video artist Namjoon Pak, um, who did sort of sublime things like this TV Buddha, I'll, you know, you could just laugh at the pun and move on, but really it could be a much deeper piece if you like. Um, he did single channel videos, but then he also did these multi-channel videos with many, many monitors creating you know, big, powerful considerations. Okay, well, I only got to 1980, and I'm going pretty long here. But, um, you know, then in the, in the final decades of the 20th century, we have, you know, media culture ideas from people like Warhol and McLuhan. You know, new drawing. So we're drawing, but it's very different ideas. Painting, people like Basquiat, photorealism, artists like Chuck Close, all kinds of photographers. I, I, again, this is a place that's pretty anemic on this chart. I, Cindy Sherman, I talk a little bit about up here in identity, but, you know, we should talk about lots of other photographers there. Um, film and video, Bill Viola, Matthew Barney, pretty interesting. If you follow these links, you'll go to their websites. Um, performance art, I've just given you a list. Uh, all these performance artists are doing different things, exploring different ideas, and this is certainly not an exhaustive list, but so much performance art, so much powerful work in the, in the latter part of the 20th century. Installation art, Kabakov, really powerful, interesting artist, and critiquing the institution itself. Um, Fred Wilson, David Wilson, not related, but pretty interesting guys both, uh, Hans Hake, and then um, Andrea Frazier, who did pieces like Museum Highlights, where she does a performance. It's a, it's a performative sort of museum tour guide. And it's, it's, again, it's one of these things that's very playful but very powerful at the same time. In her, in her docent tour, she talks about a water fountain, and it's not like a Duchamp urinal. It's, a, it's just a regular old water fountain in the museum. But she uses these you know, very effusive sort of art uh, terminology to describe it. And, and again, it's kind of funny, but it really makes us wonder, you know, what is it that the cultural institution is doing? How does it function? What, what values does it promote and privilege and so on? Um, and then, you know, much to say about identity. Uh, so many different artists in, you know, throughout time, but certainly in the last few decades of the 20th century, a lot of identity work. And Nikki S. Lee will say a little bit about in a, in a separate Artist of the Week piece. So that's a you know, really whirlwind 20th century. Um, many, many different things for you to dive in on there. Thanks a lot.